Did you ever have Fruit Loops as a kid? You know that cereal with the little O things? Yeah, Derek didn't. Today, I'm going to show you how to make a mead that tastes like that without actually putting in any of the stuff that's in that cereal. Hi, I'm Brian. I'm Derica, and you're watching City Studying. To learn to grow and brew, and to take control of your food, hit subscribe now. And don't forget to hit the bell icon so you'll be the first to be notified when we have something new to share. Speaking of that, I actually found out recently that that bell icon does not notify every single person that's a subscriber. What it does is it looks at your interaction. If you interacted with a video like this in the past, then it will send you a not notification, but you have to interact. In other words, you have to like it or comment on it. Now we get a lot of comments and we get a lot of likes. I know most of you are already doing these things, but if you never do, like if you just kind of sit back and watch it and you never interact with the video, you might not be getting the notifications when we make a new video. I just found this out yesterday. Please, you know, just say something, say hi, wave, hit like, whatever you got to do. That way you can be in touch because I know um, I've been, at, I've had a few people say, hey, you guys put up a video three hours ago. I didn't even see it. Okay. That's proof right there that they're not, not coming up for everybody. So just interact with the video in some way and that way you get notified every time. Okay. So like I said, Fruit Loops meat. I'm going to let you in on a little secret that I learned from a couple of friends of ours. They had this plant growing on their property that they make tea from. And they said, yeah, when we make the tea, it tastes just like Fruit Loops. What? No way. Can't be. Sure enough, we tried it. It does. Derica can't actually attest to it because growing up, she didn't eat the sugary, crazy food like most of us did. I don't know. She doesn't like cereal. I don't eat it anymore, but I used to like it. But anyway, that secret plant is lemongrass. Of all the things lemongrass it's crazy so what i have here is a whole bunch of lemongrass that i chopped up in, into pieces i couldn't even get a measurement on this i mean what is it a couple of cups maybe a couple of two three cups i can measure this and then later on do it i'll do that later because i'm getting water all over <laughs> he's making a mess i'm making a mess this is what i do <laughs> i'm gonna make up a t-shirt that says what's your superpower i make messes and i know things that's all i need anyway so this is a mead this is a simple, simple mead. This is, there's nothing too complicated about this, but this is going to be a special mead because I'm doing something a little different this time. Let me go through the ingredients first, and then what I just said will make more sense. So to do this, you're going to need the lemongrass. It looks like, I don't know, three cups or so. You're going to need water. Okay, this is again our tap water. It's been filtered. It's not chlorinated water. You're going to need honey. We warmed this up a little bit. We're gonna put it back in the hot water so that it runs nice and easy. Need about, I'm gonna do two and a half pounds in this. I'll explain why in a minute. Gonna need a test tube and hydrometer. Not 100% absolutely necessary, but if you don't have one and this doesn't work and you write to me and say, Brian, what did I do wrong? I can't help you without a hydrometer reading. His I really first need question to know. normally when somebody comes to him with a brew problem was what, <laughs> what was, was your, your original gravity? Unfortunately, two thirds of the time, the answer is I didn't take one. And these are people that have a hydrometer. <laughs> Why didn't you take one? Just take the hydrometer reading. It, it's a pain in the butt. I will admit it. I don't like having to do it myself, but you know what? It solves a lot of problems down the road. So we do it. You're going to need a strainer. Um, something that fits over like the picture that your water is in would be helpful because that'll come in handy later. Um, an airlock. I like this style of airlock. Look, we already have sanitizer in it. Yeah, Derek is smart. Uh, and then it fits into a lid. I like to use an open or a wide mouth fermenter for this. You can use a bucket if you want to. I just don't like using buckets. It's a personal thing. Um, we have cats, so I don't like to get too much air in there, if you get what I mean. Cat hair, pfft, pfft, not a good thing. So the way to do this is very, very, very simple. The first thing you want to do is make a tea. Okay. For this tea, what I did here is I filled this about three quarters of the way with water. This is a one gallon pitcher. So I know later on when I mix my water with honey, when I mix the tea into this, I have roughly the same amounts, right? Did any of that make sense? Sort of. Okay, good. Then I'm, I'm working. So what I'm going to do is pour these in first. Okay, so 
while you weren't watching, I weighed the lemongrass. I really did. It I was, was there. Yeah. I saw it. Five and a half ounces. If you used five, if you used six, I don't think it's going to make all that much difference. What we want to do, though, is make a tea. So I'm just going to... So before he pours it in there, I want to make a point that the majority of our weight came from the stems of the lemongrass mm -hmm. because that has more of the juices that we're trying to extract when making this tea. It's not primarily leaves, though... I used mostly stems. There are some leaves in there. It's There's some leaves, mostly too. mostly stems. We made a tea of this once, and I couldn't remember if we used stems or leaves, so I decided mostly stems, just because it seems more practical. But there's some leaves in there. And I cut them all into about, you know, one and a half, two inch pieces. I didn't get too critical with it, I just snipped them off. And uh, now I'm going to add some water, just clean water. And remember, you need water for mead anyway. So that's why I'm trying to use some of the water that I'm going to put in. But I'm also going to use this to cool the tea once it's done. You just want to get everything in there good. We're going to use our spoon. I'm going to turn it on, crank that sucker up to max. You have a new job. Anyway, next thing, get out my scale. And based on past history, <laughs> some of you will be very happy to know that I'm just going to dump the honey right into the fermenter. And I'm not going to worry about that. And, I'm, and I want to use, I'm going I'm to say two and a half pounds, because that puts our final ABV somewhere in the like 10 range, somewhere like that. The one thing that you probably noticed I didn't do is what's the first step that I always do with mead? Anybody know? I feel like I should have Jeopardy music playing. <laughs> Maybe I will. The first step is to hydrate your yeast, right? Well, guess what? This is a wild ferment, because I happen to know this honey came from a local beekeeper who kept his own bees. He didn't pasteurize it. He didn't filter it. He didn't do any crazy stuff to it. So you know what? There's yeast in here. And the reason why honey works as a preservative is because it's so dense. It has so much dense sugars in it that nothing can actually live on it. It's that hard. And it, it's that hard for it to, to eat it. But as soon as you start to dilute it, at a certain point, that's when those yeasts go, hey, we can now eat those sugars, which they don't actually eat sugars. They use sugars, but it's a whole different story. I'm not getting into that. If we weren't making a tea with the lemongrass and just adding the lemongrass directly, the wild yeast that was on the lemongrass could also help with oh, yeah. ferment. And I thought about that too, but I know that if you extract the, the, the juices and the flavors from it, you can get actually get a little bit stronger of a flavor. And I knew that there was already yeast in the honey, so I wasn't real worried about getting it from any other source. So what I'm gonna do, I already teared this out, so it's, it's zeroed right now. I'm just gonna take the lid off, because this is gonna be a lot of honey. And I said two and a half pounds. See how easy that pours? That's because it was warm. Okay, so we're at two pounds, eight ounces, roughly. I went over just a tiny, tiny bit. Like, I don't know else. Anyway, we're gonna take a gravity reading eventually and we'll know, we'll know where this is at. So right now, that's where we're at. We have honey, we have our tea. The idea is to get this to a boil, hold it there for about 10 minutes. I'm gonna kill the heat and let it steep for like 15 minutes. So we'll see you once this comes to a boil. And so we're back from outer space. No, that's a whole different thing. You know the song? I know the song. Yeah. All right. So what we have is our tea. It's boiled, then it's steeped. It boiled for about five good minutes. Then we shut off the heat. The, plot, the plate is still kind of hot. Let it go for a full 15 minutes, right? So it's steeped for 15 minutes. The house smells amazing. Derica actually said we should just boil some of this every morning so that the house smells great. We actually have big pots like this full of this stuff. If you follow us on Facebook, you would have seen a teaser photo of a giant grass-like plant. <laughs> That's our lemon, That's one of our lemongrass plants, which today in harvesting this for this video, I realized there is a fist-sized wasp nest attached to that plant. Not for long. So yeah, um, but that image, that teaser image on Facebook was in reference to this video. Okay, so what I want to do is, this is hot. If I pour this in now, right into the honey, probably going to kill off my yeast. I don't want to do that. 
warm, I don't mind. So I'm going to do, get my strainer, and I'm pouring it back into this pitcher of water. This is cool water, like, you know, below room temperature probably. And I'm going to totally spill this all over the place. So I'm pouring it in here to mix it, and you'll probably see a little bit of a color difference, you know, if the honey wasn't directly in front. Let me just move that so you can see. It's kind of a yellowish color. I'm trying, just trying not to get any of it into the mix here. Basic straining, 101. <laughs> I want to get it all out because, you know, that's the flavors. Bend at the knees. It's important. <laughs> okay, now I can't move. jeez. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yep. So Brian has so kindly demonstrated for you what he means by he makes messes. Yep. I'm good at it though. I'm gonna take temperature reading on this, mix it up a little bit. It's probably still too warm. Oh, maybe not. We're looking for something... Under 115. I'm a little cautious. I want it to be, a, really I want it to be under 100. Because we are talking wild yeast here. They're a little more volatile and less hardy maybe than the commercial strains that are made for doing this stuff. And it's at 110. So we're gonna cut here for a few minutes. Wait for this to cool a little bit. See you in a minute. All right, so we've cleared out a couple things and it's cooled a bit. It's still a little bit over 100 degrees, but I figure we should be safe. Beehives tend to be warm. Bees have a much higher temperature than we do. And I mean, it came from Florida, so this stuff is, it should be a little bit more hardy. Now, I know some of you were admiring my stick that was hanging right about here. This stick was made by my friend Ben at Ironside Woodworks. And uh, that the runes mean what? Luck. Luck. Now, this was made specifically for me to do wild ferments with. This is my magic stick. If you'd like a magic stick, links in the description. Ben's waiting. He's going to make them individual. Each one is going to be unique. I have no idea what he's charging for these things. I, we actually don't even make any money off of this. No, we don't. <laughs> I just realized that. He does offer them in untreated, so this is just raw wood with the um, etching and it's burnt. But. He made me two. I think he actually made more, he just gave me two. <laughs> and then he charred one to make it dark. So, so you have charcoal options. Um, he thought that the charring might add an interesting flavor. Now, if this was going to sit in the mead for any length of time, it might, but it's probably not gonna impart anything, but. These are sized for our big yeah, fermenter big buckets. buckets. Um, that's why they're so large. We might have to make smaller ones too. But like I said, they're all gonna be individually crafted. So you would go and see the one that you want, the way you want it, because they're all gonna be unique and different. They're all handmade. And um, that's the one you get. We had him do the runes as like an engraved in there on purpose because that way the yeast that is going to be found in the honey will embed itself into the stick that much easier. It'll actually work really well in the charred one too because that makes it very porous. So I'm curious to see if there's a difference between them. The trick is don't wash it. Just maybe like a light rinsing. That's about it. You don't really wash these things. But anyway, that's my stick. And we stalled just enough that this probably went down another degree. So I'm going to bring the honey over. And this is the super complex part of the day. I'm going to pour this into here, hopefully without making a mess. Now, because I'm me, I'm a little bit lazy and really out of shape. I'm only going to fill it halfway. Actually, there's a really good reason for this. I'm going to put my thumb over the bung hole. Somebody's going to say it. <laughs> By only putting it halfway, first, it does make it a little bit lighter. It gives a lot more agitation, but it also lets me get more oxygen into that mix. It spits at you. That's always a bonus. You laugh, but I never make you do this. Okay, so I shook it up a bit and splashed it all over the sides. So now I'm gonna be all sticky. It smells like honey though. 
gosh. I was going to do it in here. Oh, okay. Another reason to keep sanitizer water handy. Do you want me to pour the rest of this in for you? I would like you to pour the rest of that in for me. Although, don't go full, full. we got to leave some headroom. And I have to use my stirring stick. Tell me when to stop. Um, stop there for the moment. Now, even though I shook it up good, I'm doing this on purpose. There's two reasons. This is a brand new stirring stick. I've never used it for any brew before. Just I'm going to... I'm going to put a little bit more of this in because I don't want to waste the tea. I overestimated. But you know what? <laughs> We're going to drink that. Um, when you add sugar to that tea, it tastes amazing. So you could just literally make tea with it. Or you could be a purist and drink it straight. So what I'm doing is I'm mixing this up and you can totally smell it now. The honey mixed with that is amazing. That, that smell is just... I keep saying amazing, but it's freaking amazing. It's really good. We're so excited. I'm giving this a good mix. What I do is I go in one direction for a while, then I break that, go the other direction for a while, break that. I'm trying to get some oxygen into this must, okay? And uh, I'm also infusing this new magic stick with some yeast. So next time I make a, a, a brew, it should start up just a little bit faster. There'll be a, a little bit better of a colony of yeast already going. I would say that is stirred well. And that's that's a good amount of headroom. I don't want it to be where it could overflow because I'm being that it's wild yeast, we don't really know just how active the fermentation is going to be. So I don't want to take any chances and have it explode or whatnot. So yeah, the first thing I gotta do is take a reading. I'm gonna get out my handy dandy wine thief that is far too big for this purpose. I think it's compensating for something. <laughs> it's jealous of the stick. You might be right. <laughs> I didn't even think of that. Okay, and then take the hydrometer, drop it in, move it around a little bit, Hold on to it so you don't knock it over. Try to knock some of the bubbles away, and we're going to take a reading on this. Pretty much as predicted, 1.110. Now, this is either going to make a very dry mead or a nice sweet mead. It's very hard to know, and that's why a lot of people, myself included, have steered away from wild ferments because they like the control. Well, you know what? Sometimes a little chaos is a good thing. Now, I sterilized this tube. That is 250 milliliters of what's going to be mead. That's a third of a bottle in my mind. Think I'm going to waste that? Uh-uh. Any additional oxygen that we're putting in by pouring it's it a good in thing. is a good thing. Because at this stage, we want it to be oxygenated. Going to affix my lid and airlock. People have been talking about airlocks again. There was a couple of people that said, oh, I never use an airlock. And I've been, uh, yeah, use an airlock. It's two bucks. The link's in the description. You'll save yourself such headaches. Such headaches you will save. You get to watch the little air bubbles go bloop. Yeah, that's the fun part. Okay, some other words on this. This is a wild ferment, as has been said several times over, which means it's wild. We don't really know what's going to happen yet. It might not even start. If it doesn't, in a few days, like three, four days, if it hasn't done anything, I'll throw some yeast in it and just make it a regular meat. Okay? They do tend to take a little bit longer to get going. I'm used to my mind starting up in, you know, three, four, five hours sometimes. For whatever reason, our house, they like the yeast like our house. This one, I hope it starts today, <laughs> but I'm expecting more like, today's Friday, I'm expecting Sunday, maybe Monday to have it start. Um, and We will pin a note in the description for this video to let you know when it did Oh yeah, start. yeah, I'll give you updates on that. Um, I'll pin comments and things like that, because I know somebody's gonna ask. And again, we're hoping that it works, it should work. There should be yeast in there and it should be nice and strong. I didn't make it a super powerful mead, so this will probably end up somewhere in like the 10 to 12 range. 
so it'll be good. It might even be less. It could be more like six or seven and have a lot of sugar in it, which... Sounds hmm, awesome to me. That could be pretty interesting too, although that's a lot of sugar. It'll taste like drinking honey water with a little kick, which, well, actually sounds pretty good. But anyway, that is the basic gist of this. At this point, this is going to get put away, probably under my desk, because that's where I tend to put them all, and stored. It'll probably take anywhere from four to six weeks. At that point, we'll do a racking video. We'll show you. There'll be some sediment at the bottom. We'll put it in another bottle. Then we'll taste it, and then we'll let it age some more before we bottle it. Um, in the meantime, if you have questions or comments or anything you'd like to see us do, hit us up in the comments below. Until then, thanks, guys. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Hey, everybody. If you want to learn to grow and brew and take control of your food, don't forget to hit the subscribe icon down below and hit the little bell next to it. That way you get notified of everything we do.